All right, again, good morning and good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. My name is Jim McGowan. I am the marketing manager for Raymarine Electronics, and today I am joined by Derek Gilbert. He is our UK support manager. He's a 33-year veteran of uh, Raymarine, going way back to uh, the olden days, and uh, he's going to help us with our Get Ready for Spring webinar. If you could say hello, Derek. Yeah, hi there, everybody. Veteran makes me sound a little bit old and ancient, but uh, I'm still young at heart. <laughs> definitely, definitely. So we're talking about getting boats ready for spring. So let's kind of start with some of the basics here, uh, nuts and bolts and kind of getting the, the shrink wrap off of your boat. What do you think? Uh, what are the, some of the things that we want to take a look at right away? Uh, well, I think that the main thing is to see what's happened to the uh, boat over the winter. Has the shrink wrap strained any uh, of the equipment on board? Has it um, deformed any of the moldings or anything? And we need to look particularly at things like our radar scanners, cameras, antennas, MFDs and instruments, anything that the shrink wrap may have come into contact with, any of the top side sensors that we have on the boat. Um, we also need to start looking at uh, refitting back any of the equipment that we've removed over the winter period since last season. So we're looking for all the telltale signs of um, things that have been chafing, maybe areas where um, casings have been uh, strained and perhaps water and things like that may have got into them. We also want to start looking at the physical security of things. I mean, who knows what high winds or large uh, birds may have done sitting on the shrink wrap over the winter. So we need to look and see whether are all the bolts secured tight, um, have any of them strained or caused damage. Um, we need to look at the physical security of the equipment that's still bolted on board the boat. And um, the last thing we want is anything to have, um, be, any of the fastenings to have become loose or broken over the winter. And of course, once the boat gets uh, in the sea, we could find we might lose equipment over the side. So we want to make sure all of that is nice and secure and tight. Um, and also, finally, have a look at things like your ray dome enclosures, those big large domes and the open array antennas, just to make sure that none of those have been damaged over that winter period. Yeah, it is unusual sometimes you get a little bit of weather or you get some wind or even just some uh, overzealous shrink wrapping and uh, it, it can warp things or uh, damage things. You might not realize it. Uh, so it's definitely worth getting up there and having a, an inspection of everything topside. Yeah, that, that's for sure. I would definitely agree with that. And also any cables that have been um, run around the, the upper surfaces of the boat over that winter period. Maybe equipment's been removed. Um, and you've left uh, cables unplugged, hopefully they were all protected um, and bagged up over the winter period. But um, time to, to get those bags off, open them up, have a look, make sure there's absolutely no moisture or condensation got in there. Condensation is a really weird thing, and it can creep into the most strange places, um, even if the boat may be very dry and you may have had a uh, dehumidifier over there. I can imagine. Now, let's say we've got all of our topside stuff inspected. We're looking pretty good there. Um, I, I think one of the fundamentals we need to check are batteries and, and power systems. And, um, you know, we know obviously we're dealing with electronics. Everything has got a computer inside of it. And those things are pretty sensitive to voltage, as I understand. Um, what are some things we want to look at during our spring tune-up? Yeah, exactly. We, we want to... Um have a look particularly at our, our batteries. Um, batteries very often get overlooked. They're buried down in the depths of the boat somewhere. Um, they have a pretty tough old life sat down there. One moment they're, they're in the cool and cold. The next moment somebody's trying to draw five or 600 amps from them to get a, an engine turned over. So we need to look very closely at our batteries. First of all, look at the general external condition of them. Um, do you see any signs of sulfating or uh, chemical buildup on the outside of the terminals because all that needs to be cleaned away. Um, the the uh, heavy duty cables need to be um, resecured to the battery posts, making sure that there's no areas where you can get any poor contact going on there. 
If you want to have a look as well at the battery voltage, if you uh, put a multimeter across the battery, if you're measuring a good 12 volts, then actually that battery is pretty much discharged. Um, a fully charged or a, a good condition battery, you're going to be looking at between 13.2 and 13.6 volts. So if you're only reading 12 volts on that battery, you've got to be suspicious that there's something else going on. Maybe over the winter period, they haven't been cycle charged. Um, maybe you need to um, fully recharge them again. If you're charging them, you need to look at what you're charging them with. If you overcharge them, then some batteries can gas up and um, that can cause a problem with the, the fumes. Um, you could also have issues with failed cells. So although you may be measuring 12 volts, as soon as you put any form of a load on that battery, that, that voltage um, drops right away. So uh, an easy thing to check would be, can you put a load on, say turn all, the, all of the lights on, and look and see if that voltage starts dropping away straight away, then that's telling you you've got a battery problem. If you've got a problem with your batteries, there's really not much point going further forward testing the rest of the electronics. You've got to get them sorted out first. Other yeah, that's really the foundation. Yeah, other things to look at. Uh, all the batteries should be properly secured down in place. Um, so make sure if there are any battery restraining straps, they haven't um, deteriorated over the winter. They're all nice and tight. And make sure all those contacts are nice and clean. Um, if we sort of move on and look at your, your fuse panel there. Um, again, the fuses over the winter, they can all look fine. Um, but over the winter, condensation can get in there. You can get a bit of verdigris building up. And that can put a high resistance connection across that fuse. And again, as soon as you turn the electronics on, they draw a bit of current, the voltage drops down, and you get your, your equipment just power cycling constantly um, and not being able to power up cleanly and boot up properly. Yeah, I noticed this uh, battery terminal obviously looks very brand new uh, in this photograph, uh, but it is nice and clean, and it really doesn't take a whole lot of salt uh, build up from the prior year sitting on it all winter uh, to, to make it turn green. So um, definitely a good tip there. Um, another thing I noticed in this photo, and I think we'll see it coming up as well, is the, the way that they have all the wires actually very nicely organized and restrained uh, going in here. Um, it's definitely worth taking a look at your own boat systems and kind of seeing how your wires are organized and how they're restrained. Yeah, that, that's really important. We're, we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. But um, you know, a boat in a seaway, it works, it moves, everything's vibrating. And if cabling isn't properly restrained and properly secured, it'll chafe. And over a period of time, you'll either fatigue and, and break the copper conductors on the inside of the cabling. Um, and and if, it, if that's a live conductor, you could then be into issues with short circuits, blowing fuses, uh, random power cycling, all sorts of things. And those random things, are incredibly difficult to chase down. So a bit of work before you get to that point, properly restraining things, pro using cable ties, using securing trunking, all of those things will all pay dividends in the future um, and in avoiding the, all these sort of random problems you can come across on a boat. Very good. So we've talked about some of our top side electronics. We've talked about the basics and our power systems down inside. Uh, let's go underneath the boat for a second and talk about transducers. So we got some different examples here, and you know, certainly depending on what kind of boat you have and whether you're a sailboater or a cruising power boat or a fishing power boat, the transducers may look very different, uh, but they all kind of do the same thing. Um, what are some things we should look at on our transducers as we're getting started up for the season? Yeah, the, the transducers, again, get a pretty tough life, um, submerged under the boat all the time, and then you haul them out, um, stick them on a, on a hard, and um, obviously we're going to be looking for things like mechanical damage. Has, has anything damaged them over the winter period while the boat's been out of the water? Um, and it gives us a good opportunity to properly inspect those transducers to make sure that the faces of those transducers are all nice and clean. Any sort of debris buildup, uh, weed, fouling, barnacles, whatever, living on the face of those transducers will all cause their performance to become reduced. Um, and so we need to make sure they're all nice and clean. 
don't uh, be very careful not to scratch them with, with um, scouring pads and stuff, really hard abrasive things. Um, a good bit of cleaning, bit of elbow grease with, with warm soapy water. You can get a lot of the, the marine growth off of that. And you can then properly inspect the face of that transducer to make sure nothing's happened to it. Now, once, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, John. Oh, no, I was going to ask, once, um, you know, once you get some power applied to the system, the transducer's clean, obviously, if the boat's still up on a boat stand, uh, it's probably not going to work particularly well. But are there any clues to, to tell me if it's, you know, if it's working? Yeah, I mean, for the depth transducers, you can always put your ear against the um, face of the transducer and you should hear it ticking. Um, it, it's not going to do you any damage, and generally you wouldn't leave your transducer powered up for um, a, a significant period of time. But running it for five minutes just to check that it's working is going to be fine. Some of the really big transducers, where you're talking of the two and three kilowatt transducers, can develop quite a bit of heat. Um, so I wouldn't run those for more than a few minutes with the boat out of the water. But you can run them long enough to, to hear the transducer ticking. If it's ticking, that's a pretty good indication that the system is alive and well and should work um, when you, you put the boat in the water. If you're lucky, um, and depending on the surface underneath the boat, um, if it's a really reflective surface, you know, a decent bit of concrete, or um, you could even put a, a small uh, pane of glass under it. That, that will reflect the signal back to the transducer and you'll see some form of a reading on the display. Um, it obviously won't be correct because uh, you're, you're using it in air rather than in water, but at least it will tell you the transducer is picking up a signal. And with the paddle wheel, if you spin the paddle wheel, blow on it. If you, if you blow on it, it should spin very freely. If you have to give it a good old flick with your finger, you probably need to start thinking about changing the um, paddle wheel in the shaft itself um, because the bearings in there may well be worn. But you can spin the paddle wheel and you should be able to see um, some sort of speed register on the display. And if you look at the temperature, it should be reading the air temperature um, around the transducer as well. I know sometimes uh, when people inspect paddle wheels, they get a uh, quite a rude surprise, and the and the wheel itself isn't there anymore. You know, it's just the uh, the shaft is in the boat, and the wheel has has gone into the briny deep. Um, do we do we have kits to uh, to service those? Yeah, we absolutely do. We have service kits uh, which include a paddle wheel, a new shaft, um, the kit. Some of them also include the non-return valve inside the transducer housing as well. Most of the transducers, the retractable speed transducers these days, have a removable um, insert in them, and there's a, a flapper valve assembly inside the housing, um, which reduces the inflow of water when the boat's uh, afloat. It's always a good idea to just check to make sure while the boat's on the hard, pull that transducer insert in and out a few times, make sure it doesn't get stuck, uh, make sure the O-rings are, are lubricated as well, um, because once the boat's in the water, it, it's quite difficult to put any uh, real load on that transducer to pull it out. Um, so make sure that it, if it's supposed to be retractable, that you do that before the boat goes afloat. So um, I know another thing that is a, a good idea, you know, as people are getting ready for spring, they're often painting the bottom of their boat, uh, replenishing the, the anti-foul. Um, how, how do we deal with that? and the transducers that are down there? Yeah, there are, there are some recommended uh, anti-foul paints specifically for transducers. Um, and you, you do need to be careful which paint you use and how you apply it. Um, for example, if you're having the anti-foul sprayed onto the underneath of the boat, you want to make absolutely sure that that spray doesn't go over the face of the transducer, simply because the the spray is diluted with a solvent to make it um, more uh, easier to spray. And um, that solvent will more than likely attack the face of the transducer. So you should mask off the face of the transducer um, and you should then um, paint the transducer with a, with a paintbrush with one of the proprietary recommended anti-foul paints um, that are for transducers. They're usually a water-based paint rather than a solvent-based paint and you put a thin coating on the transducer face itself 
Um, you don't want to get any bubbles. You don't want to put a thick coating on there um, because if you have bubbles, those will interfere with the operation of the transducer itself. And there's a number of recommended transducers that uh, people like um, AMR and Gemico will, will recommend for them. Yeah, and I think those brands, you know, they'll vary depending on where you live. Uh, we have some examples of some of the more common ones, but uh, you may find others in your local market as well. Uh, but you are looking for something that, that says it's transducer compatible, transducer safe. Yeah, just just rely on them. If you're not sure, just just ask the, um, the, the suppliers, the paint shop to do it. Um, but what you're trying to do is make sure you clear off any of the barnacles, first of all. Use a a very light sort of plastic scraper. Don't damage the acoustic window on the depth transducers. And then once you've cleaned it off, you can put a light coating of paint around it, and that should be good. You can also put a, a very light coating of paint on the speed transducer as well. Um, you can, using a small artist brush, you can paint the uh, different little um, steps on the speed transducer. And that would just help that over a period of time to um, stay clearer. Very good. Yeah, it's very easy for the barnacles to uh, to foul that and the wheel doesn't turn anymore. Yeah, and it varies so much from, from place to place. You can find some places um, you can leave the, the speed transducer in the hull all year round and, it, and it's perfectly fine any time you want to use the boat. Other places you leave the speed transducer in the boat for more than two days and Little uh, animals crawl in along the uh, the shaft, block the speed transducer, the impeller from uh, rotating, and you know you have to withdraw those transducers every single time you stop the boat. So it really does vary from from area to area. And I think that actually kind of leads to a, another um, kind of final thing on transducers too is that anytime you have uh, through hulls that have retractable paddle wheels or even retractable depth sensors. Those through hulls usually come with um, a service plug, don't they? Um, so we want to want to make do. sure that we we have those. <laughs> yeah, they do. And it's any time you're thinking of removing the um, retractable insert from a hull fitting with a boat afloat, you you would never do that unless you have the plug in your other hand. Right. So definitely, before you uh, get the boat back in the water, <laughs> make sure you have that plug on hand. <laughs> yeah. Very good. That's for sure. So let's uh, let's talk autopilots for a couple of minutes. And in the Raymarine line, we break autopilots down by their drive type. So we have autopilots that have mechanical drive systems, like we're showing here. The one on the left is a rotary drive, driving a chain and sprocket system, uh, most likely on a sailboat of some kind. Um, the one on the right there is a mechanical linear drive, so it's actually pushing on a rudder quadrant. Um, these these systems are pretty strong. They're pretty beefy. Um, what are some of the things we want to check before we put them into service for the season? Yeah, you're right, Jim. They, we need to be quite careful with these because the linear drive in particular can output um, uh, about three quarters of a ton of thrust. And so if it's not mounted securely, you can get into a lot of bother. But if we start with a rotary drive, um, the rotary drive, as you can see there, it's got chain running around a, a lay shaft. Um, and we need to make sure that those chains are, are the correct tension. If it's too loose, the chain will jump teeth, and very quickly you'll, you'll lose all the teeth on your sprocket, and that will be the end of your drive. Um, if it's too tight, then it can wear the bearings of the drive unit, but also it can make the steering system really quite stiff. So we need to just check that that, that, belt, that uh, chain is the right tension. We need to make sure it's lightly greased, we should also make sure that there are enough adjustment shims available so we can modify that belt, that chain tension through the course of the season if we need to. Um, so we put a, a bit of light grease on not only the chain, but also it's a good time to have a look at the steering system in general. Uh, again, the tip there is if your steering cables are too loose, you'll have really sloppy steering. If your steering cables are too tight, your steering is going to be very, very stiff and tight, and the autopilot is really not going to work very well because not only is it dealing with the load of the water on the rudders, but it's also dealing with all this high back drive within your steering system as well. You can also check the, um, all the mounting bolts to make sure the bolts are all, all secure and stiff. Um, sometimes you find these drives are mounted on wooden surfaces, and over a period of time, 
those wooden services, um, they, they gradually move and uh, the bolts can then start to fatigue and, and sometimes shear. So looking at the drive unit mountings is really important that they're mounted on a solid, secure, substantial surface that isn't going to move, that isn't going to uh, shrink and, and allow the mounting bolts to become loose. Once those bolts become loose, it's just a question of time before um, something shears and something breaks. So you just need to pay a lot of attention to those. Make sure they're tight, put a little bit of grease on them to keep them in all good condition. Um, and that will probably be good enough to, you know, with your drives. Um, also have a look to make sure there's no obstructions in the way of the drive at all. Nothing's in danger of getting caught up in the chain um, as the rotary drive operates. And make sure that nothing has fallen into or can fall into the quadrant. So as the linear drive pushes and pulls, it's perfectly free and easy to, to push and pull. And nothing's going to put any extra load on it. Um, run the, the rudder from harder port to harder starboard by hand, first of all, just to make sure everything's clear. Noting as well that the, the physical mechanical end stops of the boat should stop the rudder before the, the drive unit runs out of travel. But that will also, if the drive unit itself is used as an end stop, that will damage the thrust bearing in the drive unit and you're, you'll have another expensive repair bill on your hands there. So it's just a question of making sure that everything runs freely, runs smoothly. You could always flip the end of the linear drive off of the quadrant and just test by putting your foot against the quadrant and giving it a push. If it takes a, just a little grunt, if you like, to, to move the rudder and move all the uh, drive system and turn the steering wheel, then that should be fine. If you've got to put two feet against it and go red in the face when you push it, then there's something wrong with your steering system. Um, and there's no point putting the autopilot drive back on until you fix that, because um, the problem will be just the same in the water. I mean, obviously, if the boats are ashore, you need to make sure that you can turn the rudder safely um, without anybody else outside the boat getting injured by it. So we've talked a lot about mechanical systems, um, but we do a wide array of hydraulic autopilots too. Um, so with hydraulics, obviously, you've got a lot of fluid, um, you've got some hoses, you've got pumps and things like that. I imagine uh, one of the key things is, is checking for leaks. Yeah, yeah, it's it's always um, something that hydraulic pumps are usually sort of, again, buried down below the in the engine room somewhere. Um, key to hydraulics is make sure you've got plenty of, of lint-free cloth, you've got clean oil, and you've got the right size uh, wrenches and spanners if you need to tighten anything up. Have a look at all the connections on all of your hoses. And again, make sure that all your hoses are secured because if your hoses can flap around, again, when the boat's at sea, those hoses are gonna flap around, they'll start fatiguing and you'll start to get damaged hoses and hydraulic oil leaks. And those are exactly the things that you don't want while you're at sea. So now is a good time to go through your steering system, look at all those hoses, check the routing of them, Make sure wherever they pass through bulkheads that there's some form of support around them so they're not chafing against the edge of the bulkhead. And make sure the connections are all nice and secure. If you do have to replace any of the hoses, um, a couple of golden things to remember. Don't use things like that white PTFE tape uh, on the connections because bits of that tape can come off inside the fitting. They'll get spread around your hydraulic steering system, and they can quite often jam valves open. So um, make sure, don't use that. Use something like a, a, a jointing uh, thread lock, Loctite thread lock or something like that. Um, another good point to remember is that hydraulic fluid uh, is also slightly hygroscopic, which means that it'll, it'll absorb a small amount of moisture. Um, and if that hydraulic fluid hasn't been changed for a number of years, it's possibly a good idea to think about flushing that oil through, uh, putting fresh oil in, and then, of course, re-bleeding the whole system to make sure you've got no pockets of air in the system and that your reservoir uh, tank is, is well topped up. And as the picture shows, um, hopefully you can see the picture there with the hydraulic pump, it's got the hoses coming out the top of the pump. That is the, the, the best 
orientation for the pump so that any air that builds up inside the pump will, will exhaust vertically up through those hoses and make their way up through the reservoir line to the helm pump reservoir. So another key component of the autopilot is its heading sensor. And uh, we'll have some pictures of those popping up in just a second. And there's um, a couple of different models out there that are very common. So as these pictures load up, the one on the left is our Evolution EV1 or EV2 sensor. And the one on the right is a uh, Raymarine Fluxgate compass sensor. Now, I know um, from fo folks that I've talked to through the years, um, a lot of people don't realize that these sensors, they get mounted in some pretty strange places on the boat. Why, why is it so important to actually know where these sensors are mounted, Derek? Okay, well, these, these sensors are, are really the heart of the autopilot. And um, the, the better the quality of the heading information, the better the performance of the autopilot. Um, they're, all, they're usually mounted in a fairly obscure place, quite close to the pitch and roll center of the boat. Um, but a lot of other equipment gets mounted there, so they then tend to get moved sort of aft, outboard, and up. Um, and of course, they're very sensitive to anything ferrous, magnetic, um, or anything like that. So not only do you have to be wary of what's mounted in the immediate area of the compass or the EV heading sensor, You've got to look out for what's mounted on the other side as well. I, I've had a number of suggestions made over the years about perhaps putting them in a, a lead box uh, to try, try and uh, protect them from other magnetic things around them. Um, and whilst the lead works very well with green kryptonite, it doesn't do anything for uh, magnetism. <laughs> so you, you just need to be aware of what's around it, not only you, but also your guests on board. Um, all it takes is a, is a toolbox, a, a mobile phone, a cell phone, um, a loudspeaker, fire extinguisher, some cutlery, whatever. Anything that, that has a, a slight magnetic content will affect the autopilot compass, um, and then it will cause you all manner of performance problems, oversteering, understeering, uh, no steering at all. Um, so good idea over the winter when... People tend to move stores around the boat, move equipment around the boat, perhaps fit new equipment. Just make sure everybody's aware where this heading sensor is so that you can give it a good wide berth. In a perfect world, you'd have it at the center of a um, six foot diameter ball with nothing in it at all. Clearly that's impractical on most boats. So it's always a bit of a compromise. And of course, that's where the skill of the autopilot comes in um, because the autopilot do have um, an ability to detect and compensate for sources of local magnetic deviation. Um, but that will only work up to a certain point. If you stick a 10-inch subwoofer on the other side of the bulkhead, uh, the pilot, the heading sensor and the autopilot will stand no chance at all. Yeah, that's, that's a pretty big magnet. <laughs> yeah. So make sure, I, I would always say, make sure you know where the compass is um, and mark it so that your guests on board know where it is. And also, if there are any joins in the cable leading to it, um, something we haven't mentioned uh, at the moment is it's a good idea to chase through all of your wiring on the boat so that you know where any junction boxes are, joins and things, because there are a number of tests that you can carry out, just like we, we mentioned um, for the um, autopilot motors where you can put it in auto and see if the clutch engages or not. There's some other simple tests you can carry out with a multimeter on the compass and some of the instruments, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, and if you know where the, the connection boxes are, you can easily carry out those tests in those positions. Yeah, speaking of um, of instruments, um, let's look at those because there are, they're very similar, actually, to some of the autopilot components, particularly the control heads, and, and they often work together, and they they work on the same networks. Um, so kind of regardless of what series of instruments you might have out there, everything from our oldest ST30, you know, ST40, ST50, ST60 series, right on up through the new I70 and P70 controllers, they all have a, a network backbone behind them, and that backbone provides the power and the data communication 
Um, so you talked about some of those behind the scenes things to, to look for injunctions and, and cables and that, that leads really nicely into this topic here. Um, I, I know one of the things in particular is the, the power feed. It's, it's really important to know where the power comes from, uh, that powers all these instruments. Um, I think a lot of times that will come from an autopilot course computer. Is that right, Derek? Yeah, that's right. The, the, if you have a, a, an autopilot course computer, more often than not, that's used to power the whole of the um, CTORC NG network within the boat. Um, but it, it does depend uh, on boat to boat where that course computer is mounted. If it's mounted, you know, right near one end of what we call the backbone um, within the network, then you may find that actually the power isn't taken from the course computer and could be fed in somewhere else. The, the trick with CTORC NG or NME8000 is that you try and operate a balanced network with similar numbers of instruments uh, on one side of the power injection point and similar number on the other side. So it is really important to know where that power is going in. Because if you start getting issues with your network, one of the easiest ways of identifying um, where the problem lies is to start disconnecting things from the network and reducing the length of that backbone. You could find perhaps over the winter period, um, water has built up and got into a connection somewhere, um, and that's bringing the whole network down. The beauty of this is generally, once you take that uh, faulty junction or faulty connector or faulty piece of uh, equipment out of the network, the system will generally recover um, and it will give you then a clue as to where that fault was and help you chase it down. So knowing where your connections are, knowing where your connectors are, knowing where your different pieces of equipment are linked into that network is really important. And the, the spring is a great time to do it. While you're, you're having all the bottom boards of the boat up and crawling around the bilges, now's a great time to identify where all those cables are run so that you can, if you need to start isolating things, you know easy places to get to. One thing that um, I remember talking to a lot of people through the years about too, when they would call in uh, trying to troubleshoot an instrument, sometimes you'll get an instrument and it's readout might have dashes through the display um, and no response. And other times it might have zeros in the field uh, that might be unresponsive. And I think one of the key things to remember there is uh, that can be an indicator of whether or not the particular instrument uh, sees the data source for uh, whatever value that is you're looking for. So, you know, for example, if it were a wind instrument and it were dashed out, it might not be seeing the wind transducer versus if, uh, if it had zeros in those fields or, or a, a, a direction that was locked that might indicate that the sensor is there and is working, but maybe there's some other fault and it's not turning or uh, not sensing correctly. Yeah, that's exactly right, Jim. Exactly right. If it's got dashes, then the display is not communicating with the rest of the network. If it's got zeros, it is communicating, it's just not getting the data. So it could be that your, your transducers are connected through a transducer interface box um, and the network, and that box actually isn't talking to the network, or maybe there's an issue with that box. So little little clues like this give you an idea of where you need to start looking in terms of your, your troubleshooting. Just one, so, just one other point on that. Well, I, I still remember, actually, Jim. Um, sometimes you'll find that a speed display will, will show dashes uh, until you actually spin the paddle wheel because it, it's not seeing any data coming back. One, once you spin the paddle wheel, you should then start to see data. Um, instead of the uh, the dashes coming through. So another another uh, device that's you know especially important, of course, to our sailing customers, but even some power boaters will have uh, wind sensors on board, and and this device actually has quite a few cables uh, going up the mast to the masthead unit or um, or to its sensors. Um, what can you tell us about uh, kind of the preseason checks for your wind system? Yeah, I mean, the wind has a, is a, has a pretty tough job. If the mast is taken down over the winter, then quite often it gets uh, unplugged. Sometimes the, the connection doesn't get protected over the winter. Sometimes it does. Um, so that, that's the first area uh, of concern 
um, before the mast goes back up, if it's come off the boat, um, have a look at the, both the socket and the plug on the end of the transducer. Have a look at the pins. If you see any slight discoloration, green or anything like that, then you've got to be suspicious straight away that there's some moisture um, has either gotten into that block or, or on the end of the plug. Um, so that needs to be dealt with, and it's much, much easier to deal with that whilst the mast is still on the ground than climbing up the mast and trying to get to it. But the, the mast chair always seems to stop about two or three feet below the top of the mast. So it's never an easy thing to get to. Um, you've got a cable running down the mast. Well, quite often that cable's run in a conduit, um, so that helps support it and protect it. But in some cases, the cable literally is swinging free inside the mast. Bear in mind that if over, excuse me, if over the winter period, um, you have a, a radar bracket fixed to the mast or you have some other um, mechanical fixing work carried out on the mast, that could damage the cables that are run up inside the mast. So you need to be wary about that. Um, and then at the bottom of the mast, you'll have the cable coming out. And it usually has uh, five um, cores inside that cable. You would not normally use a, a deck plug to plug that in where the, the mast goes through the deck. You would normally allow that cable to stay inside the mast through the deck. And then you bring the cable up and it outside and it would be in a, a nice waterproof junction box somewhere inside the boat under the headlining or near the base of the bar, the foot of the mast inside the boat itself. And those cables, there's a, a, again, with a multimeter, you can do a simple check. If you can power the masthead transducer up, there's a simple check which we can um, find. It's on all the uh, Raymarine forums. If you have a look at the forum, there's a nice question FAQ on there, actually, that details the voltages you should expect um, at that connector block. And that will give you a clue whether the issue is with the cable running up the mast and the, the transducer at the top, or whether it's with the uh, wind display in the boat not giving power through or reading information coming from the transducer itself. So there are a number of simple checks you can carry out. Um, if the mast is down, always a good idea to check it at that point if you can. Certainly makes it a lot simpler to get to it when it's on the ground. Yeah, one, one thing I'd also mention when you're securing the uh, masthead transducer, um, particularly if the mast is up and you've decided to fit either a new transducer or you've decided to wait till it was up before you fitted the transducer, um, sometimes when you push the masthead transducer in, it appears to go fully into the socket and you can tighten the nut up, but actually the, the arm is at a slight angle to the socket itself. So once you've tightened the nut up, just give, grab hold of the arm and just give it a little push up and down very gently and just to make sure it's nice and tight and secure. If you can wobble it up or down, then that's something telling you that's wrong and that the, the masthead uh, nut isn't tightened or being secured properly or maybe even is cross-threaded. So just make sure that that's nice and tight as you, as you put that up. Yeah, you definitely don't want that to uh, to blow off <laughs> down the road. No, and also you can get water in there. I mean, as I say, they do have a pretty tough old life up there. Um, you get some seagulls even seem to have a, a great delight in attacking masthead transducers, and you suddenly find that your cups have gone. But um, whilst, whilst it's over the winter, it's all in your hands, good opportunity then to check that everything is secure and tight before it goes up. So I know on a lot of uh, modern vessels, especially, um, you'll, you might have multiple MFDs. We've got instruments. We've got transducers. We've got fish finders. Um, and a lot of those devices have behind-the-scenes components. They're not on the helm. They're hidden in all sorts of lockers and behind false doors and drawers and all sorts of other things. And we got some nice pictures of them here. These are these are from a, a installer that you know, really took a lot of time and a lot of care to mount all these things that normally aren't seen. And they even went so far as to light them up in, in sexy blue lights. But um, what are some things that we should watch for with all of these, we'll call them black box devices? Yeah, I mean, they're often referred to as, as black boxes. Uh, a lot of the Raymarine ones, of course, are gray. But 
Um, they, as you say, they get buried away. What we need to do is we need to make sure we know exactly where they all are. Uh, some of them get hidden behind um, the chart table area. Some of them get hidden in um, the after cabin, et cetera, et cetera. So find out where all of these different uh, black boxes are. Also, it's worthwhile noting that a lot of these boxes have indicator LEDs on them. So when you power them up, you can see from the color and the flash rate uh, what the status of the LED is. And that tells you what the status is of the equipment that it's talking to. So know where, where all of those go. It'll save a lot of time. It'll also help you diagnose things um, if, you're, if you're concerned that one of these isn't working properly. And a lot of these the issues can be traced to installation where perhaps the cables are, um, there's a lot of strain on the cable because the box is mounted on a bulkhead and the cable is just hanging straight down. Um, you'll notice in these pictures that the cables are nice and secure and uh, very tidy, the excess cables run in a trunking. Um, all of those things will help um, the, the, with the quality of the installation. They'll help improve the reliability um, and the performance of it. And of course, if you have any questions about um, the, the cabling here and how it should be run, then approved and certified Raymarine installers we're, are all trained and qualified um, in how to make sure that this is done correctly with the right size cabling, the right size attachments, um, and the right size of uh, fusing involved as well. Yeah, this this is definitely a case where just a little bit of attention to, to detail in the installation actually pays huge dividends over the life of the system. Yeah, it does, because also if you know where it all is, and hopefully it's all mounted in an accessible area, we do see some installations where when the when the, the boat's being built, everything's very accessible, but then subsequent equipment gets fitted and then you realize that you can't actually get to any of these um, behind the scenes boxes. That yeah, definitely makes for a, a tricky situation. <laughs> so um, with all of these devices, again, you know, it's it, they're computers and, and they run on software. Um, we have a pretty regular pattern of issuing, issuing updates uh, for multifunction displays and for our peripheral devices too. And I know it's pretty easy to use a multifunction display to keep your whole boat up to date. Can you tell me a little bit about what we're looking at here, Derek? Yeah, I mean, what we're seeing here on the, one of the multifunction displays here, it's identifying its own software level. Um, which is great because we, we can look at that straight away and identify whether it's running current software. Um, a little point here is you might have brand new equipment fitted to your boat, um, but that could have been in the supply chain for a number of weeks or months, and it could have been in the supply chain when a new software update was released. So it's always a good idea. Check what the current version of software is. You can go to the Raymarine website. In the support section of there, there's all the current versions of software of all of our current products. Um, and you can compare that with what you're seeing here. The, the display here is identifying what version of software it has. And because it has a, a Wi-Fi interface built into it, if you can link this display to your local Wi-Fi or even use your cell phone as a hotspot, you can then use this display to reach out to the Raymarine servers and download the latest version of software. Here you see um, there's a selection there, update software. If you select that, it will go off and it will find what the latest versions of software are. And what it will then do is it will then move on and it will not only identify what its software is and whether it needs to be updated, but it will also communicate with all the rest of the Raymarine equipment on the network, and it will identify the software versions of those and whether or not there's a software update available for those as well. So if you want, you can then use the MFD to update the other software of the other peripheral equipment in the network through the MFD. Um, so it makes it a very, very simple operation. Just select the items you want to be updated, and it will go through the process updating each of those. Yeah, it's definitely a, a big improvement over the olden days when we had to have, you know, separate update chips or sometimes you had to bring a laptop on board the boat and plug in and do things. And now we've uh, really automated a lot of it. Yeah, it, it's that automation has made it very much easier. 
But it, you do have to be a little bit wary because it can vary from marina to marina. And so sometimes that's why using your phone as a, as a hotspot uh, makes the whole process very much simpler. That's true. That's true. And just to, to kind of um, touch back on it, too, you know, if if you're not updating your units regularly, um, not only do we fix bugs, you know, they're, they're computerized devices and sometimes we, we do have to make corrections in them. Um, but we're also always adding new features and capabilities in our systems. So, um, you know, if you haven't updated since last fall, there's stuff that we've released over the winter that you'll want to have for the spring boating season. Yeah, and, and also, um, if you're buying a, uh, a second-hand boat, um, you have no idea what the, the previous owner used to, you know, did with the software on it. I was talking to a customer this morning, and he had version 10, where we're now on version 19 software. So it's a very simple process for him to, to get his software up to date, and um, he was completely unaware of all the extra new features that he was able to get. Yeah, we try to make it very easy, <laughs> very, very easy to update. All right, so um, probably the last bit before a lot of people are going to, uh, you know, float their boat. Uh, let's get it uh, all cleaned and polished and, and ship-shaped for the season. So uh, what are the rules around uh, cleaning all of our topside equipment, like our radars and our flitter cameras and that sort of thing? I, I think probably the rule that's right up the top there is please never, ever use a jet wash. Um, the e equipment is just designed not to be jet washed. Um, it's designed for a very hostile marine environment, but I think a, a jet wash is perhaps a bit too extreme. So yeah, mild... I'll just throw in there for, let me just interrupt you for a second, Derek, for our, uh, for our U.S. customers, he's referring to a power washer, uh, those high, you know, high pressure washer. Uh, yeah, we don't want to, <laughs> don't want to blast anything with the, with the power washer. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right there. Um, it, it's, yeah, it's just too extreme. So go go back to good old fashioned, you know, mops and buckets. Um, mild soapy detergent is the best thing to do. Um, in terms of um, detergent or soap, make sure it's an eco-friendly uh, version, boat soap or something like that. Um, because obviously the runoff is going to go into the river or into the sea. So you want to use something that, that's not going to be aggressive for the environment. Um, don't use things like abrasive scrubbers. And um, I think the days, are, unless you've got a, a, a nice teak deck where you could perhaps holly stone it, you're not going to be using something like that on um, the uh, type of uh, synthetic materials that a lot of decking is now made of. Um, and the other thing as well is if you have things like um, thermal imaging cameras, um, then you can wash the, the lenses, clean those, um, but you can use, again, a very mild um, type of uh, lukewarm water soap with a very uh, soft cloth to uh, clean that, a soft lint-free cloth. Very good. And uh, finally, let's um, let's talk about the MFDs and instruments themselves. Um, so obviously, these are high touch items, and uh, as we've all learned all over the world in the last uh, the last month or so, um, high touch things sometimes need to be cleaned a little bit better than uh, than other things around. So, what are what are some of the general cleaning uh, requirements for the MFDs and instruments? And then, uh, what are some things we can do to maybe sanitize those too? Yeah, I mean. You're absolutely right. We need to be very aware of this right at the moment. So we just need to watch out when we're cleaning these displays. A lot of them have uh, front access um, for putting charts, cards in and that sort of thing. Um, a number of them have exposed uh, connections on the back. So just be very aware of those when you're cleaning it and sloshing water around. Um, fresh water, again, lukewarm fresh water um, is, is great to use to wash away your salt crystals um, and any sand because a, a lot of um, marinas in are in areas where there's a lot of sand gets blown in the air. Um, you really want to try and avoid scratching the, the screen. A lot of the screens are coated um, with an anti-glare type and an anti-water type of material. So you really don't want to be using solvents or chemical cleaners or aggressively rubbing. Uh, gentle and, and soft is the, um, the is the name of the game here. Um, and again, you you can always dry them with a nice soft microfiber cloth. 
um, or tail just to remove any, any streaking. Um, and of course, now we particularly need to be thinking of um, bacteria and germs and such like. So you can always use a very mild alcohol-based sanitizer, less than 70% alcohol, um, or a mild soap and water, and just be very careful you clean it. Um, wouldn't use things like paper-based um, towels or cloths or impregnated uh, materials to try and clean them. Um, stick with a very nice soft uh, cottony type of cloth um, in order to, to clean that off. And definitely don't use anything like ammonia-based uh, cleaners, because that will certainly um, have a go at the coatings on the display. Well, that's all really good information, Derek. Thank you for uh, for passing it along. And uh, I think we're at the end of our show here, but I know I saw a few people chatted in some questions along the way. Uh, let's Let's take a few chat questions and just kind of see see what we got here. Again, thank you everyone for joining us today. I appreciate you sticking with us, especially with our technical challenges at the beginning. Um, I saw a good question earlier, Derek, when we were talking about the masthead transducer. Um, yeah. And uh, the cables running down to the bottom of the mast. Uh, and, and someone uh, presented the question about, you know, could could I get some waterproof connections of my own? I think they uh, they specified some of the, the Deutsch uh, DT connections, but there's all sorts of different types of waterproof connectors. Um, have you ever seen anybody do something like that on an install, or is that something that, that might be nice to keep the water out of that connection? Um, yeah, I mean, I would definitely not make the connection above the deck. Um, I, would, I would really uh, try and avoid that if I possibly could. Um, I, but below decks, you could either use a hard wireable junction block or domino block, or you could use a, a self-assembly connector, something like a Deutsch connector, something like that, um, because below decks you're going to be in a more protected environment, um, and those connections are all extremely reliable. So any, you know, a good proprietary, good quality, reliable con connector would work below decks. Very good. There's a, another uh, a tip that was actually sent in by uh, by Pablo, who's on the line. And uh, one of the things he does on his boat is when he's uh, putting his connections together, when he's plugging his cables and things in, uh, he suggests using a nice uh, marine grade uh, dielectric grease um, on his connectors. And, and I know that's a, a nice thing to do on, in any type of electrical application that sees the weather, that dielectric grease will protect all those pins, uh, keeps the salt air off of them. Yeah, that's a, that's a brilliant idea. I've seen a number of those uh, connectors in use before. Some of them you you simply squeeze together, uh, put the put the cables in, and then squeeze the case connector together. Um, and the the dielectric then surrounds all of the exposed conductor as well as some of the insulated cable. So those are are really good. Um, I've also seen some larger ones used for um, Ethernet style connections where you have like a um, a silica a type of um, silicon material, a gel material inside. Um, it, it's completely um, electrical inert. And when you put the connector inside, um, you, you close the outer casing down and it completely seals it. The great part of those is that you can open the connectors later on and gently pull the cables out of this gel and all the gel gets left behind, and you can then reopen the, the connector and, uh, you know, change the wiring. So, oh, that's great. Again, good quality connections like that are, are brilliant. Excellent. So uh, I want to encourage everybody, if you have additional questions, um, even though, uh, you know, the world is kind of melting down around us, um, Ray Marine is actually uh, is open most of our our staff are uh, working from home, but uh, our phone lines are manned. Um, we're on social media. Um, our forum uh, is open. So certainly feel free to reach out to us with particular questions about your setup or your systems. We're happy to, to help you with that as you work towards getting your boats ready for spring. Uh, so with that, I think we're going to sign off here. I want to thank you all for joining us.